Hello. Our story begins hours after one of many confrontations Anakin had with Dooku since Genosis. Not long before that, Anakin learned that Obi-Wan Kenobi had faked his death in an attempt to get behind enemy lines. In reality, it worked, but Anakin couldn't possibly understand why. Obi-Wan and the Council would hide that from him. Obi-Wan told him that they kept the information secret as a means to keep up the public appearance of Kenobi's death. The intention was to make the bounty hunters hired by the Separatists and Dooku fully believe that Obi-Wan had died. It would completely throw them off of any chance of finding out that the Jedi Master had survived. Anakin's genuine reaction sold it. However, Anakin's heart was thrown through a whirlwind. He didn't talk to anyone for several hours, and then his anger showed. In the process, he almost killed Obi-Wan, and then, here he was, left with the reality of a great lie. The fact that Obi-Wan had really been alive the entire time, and kept it a secret from him, really hurt. Was Anakin happy that his former master was alive? Of course he was, but he was genuinely hurt. It felt like years of trust had just been disrupted by the Council. But even as much as Anakin would like to blame the Council for it, it seemed more in part Obi-Wan's decision and then it was backed by the Council. Anakin spent the night pacing back and forth inside of his makeshift room here on Naboo. He was with Padme, but she was sleeping, and she hadn't caught the feeling of him up and about. Their room was in the politician's building not far from the palace. Most of the Jedi had relocated back to Coruscant, and Palpatine was still here, which is why Anakin was on Naboo. He stepped out onto the balcony and looked over the city streets. It was so peaceful and quiet. His mind was an uncanny valley of disruption and disgust. He couldn't really piece together why he would be lied to like that. Anakin sat down on the balcony's chair and leaned over against the railing, putting his head down on the stiff railing and looking down at the streets, following the line of lights all the way to the end of the block. His eyes paced back and forth, and his mind did the same. It was mostly subconscious disbelief, repeating the same frustrations he'd been repeating since the early hours of the afternoon, after he learned that Obi-Wan selectively lied to him. Anakin thought on what Palpatine said to him when they were inside of the palace. Palpatine congratulated him on how much of an accomplished plan it was to fake Master Kenobi's death as a means to capture the Separatist conspirators. Anakin obviously told the Chancellor that he wasn't in on the joke. This line of thinking made Anakin believe that he was overanalyzing the circumstances laid before him. His mind stopped, and he remembered all the criminals he brought to the Council just for them to vanish from the face of the galaxy. He thought about all the horrid times he had inside the Jedi Temple. His heart was hit with a jolt, a shock of pulsating pain. He stumbled back in his seat, his back missing the edge of the chair and falling onto the ground. Anakin closed his eyes and his chest heaved up and down. This was nothing short of a panic attack, and the subconscious revealed a thought that could certainly alter the future of the galaxy. Anakin took this thought into his consciousness and internalized it alongside the pain that crossed his body. He reached his hand up to his chest and pressed down, his heart moving a million miles an hour. He leaned his back up against the railing in the side of the building, into a tiny cocoon. He thought of approaching Padme, but dismissed his feelings, deciding it best not to wake her. In reality, she would have been up for him if she knew he needed it. But in this current mindset, he couldn't grasp that reality. Anakin shook his head a little bit, trying to shake the feelings from his body. These little jitters were etching away at him. It was an incurable itch. It felt like skin crawling. Anakin took a deep breath and pulled his head back and looked up. He felt some peace cover him, which was accompanied by chills. Anakin spent time hugging himself and warming himself and comforting himself. The thought that now sat in the forefront of his mind was anxiety inducing, but in reality it could be potential means to solving some issues within the Jedi. Anakin thought to himself that he should allow his mind to come to terms with this proposition. In the morning, he would approach this concept again. Anakin made his way back for the bed, and before he knew it, the sun was shining and it was time to move on out to Coruscant. Anakin realized he would have the perfect opportunity to consult his mentor, at least the mentor he trusted about this matter. Surely Palpatine would have some positive reinforcement for some questions Anakin was going to ask. However, as much as Anakin trusted Palpatine, he didn't want to disclose what he was about to do, or at least what he was thinking about doing. Several hours would go by. Palpatine had a speech, and then the senators from Naboo and the Chancellor joined the Queen in a large brunch. It was a full day, but as the afternoon came around, it was time to leave. Padme said her goodbyes to Anakin as he joined Palpatine on the Chancellor's escort. Padme wouldn't be coming back to Coruscant immediately anyways. On the vessel, Anakin asked key questions, however, not what Palpatine would have ever expected to hear. Asking how did Palpatine garner support for his movement? Did Palpatine thrive because of his public speaking, or his thoughts and plans? What did he do to separate himself from what was already established? How did Palpatine 
opportunity to handle adversity to this new way of handling things. For the Chancellor, he found this line of questioning to be rather odd. Typically, he and Anakin would have a number of conversations, all of which were very friendly, and typically not that deep. However, this conversation was clearly politically motivated. Palpatine was left wondering if Anakin had any interest in becoming a politician, reminding him that Tatooine had no representatives inside of the Republic. Anakin shook off these questions. He didn't want to lie to Palpatine, but he also didn't want to tell the truth, so he twisted it just a little, suggesting that he was simply curious, which was true. Anakin, during this line of questioning, sounded like a little kid, one berating their parents in the belief that the omnipresent adult had all the answers to the galaxy, though they don't always, but Palpatine for the most part did. When Anakin returned to the temple, his demeanor had changed. Ahsoka learned of Obi-Wan's fake death, and she wasn't pleased. However, she at this point was more so interested in Anakin's reaction to this. She didn't necessarily want to go against Anakin on this issue. She of course wasn't happy about being lied to, but she to a certain extent understood why it was done. Though did Anakin see it that way, or was there something else? It was most certainly something else, and Ahsoka picked up on it immediately. The two of them went to Anakin's room to discuss it. Ahsoka sat at his makeshift desk, and he sat on his bed, telling her that he had thoughts about the Order as a whole. Ahsoka was curious to see where this went, so she encouraged him to express everything. Anakin told Ahsoka that he didn't resent the Jedi, but he resented the Jedi. Did that make sense? No. Okay, let's try again. Anakin didn't, in his heart of hearts, hate the Jedi for what they were. Instead, he hated the code and the crumbling of their ideals. Ahsoka leaned back and nodded her head, just simply waiting for what the catch was. What was this big thing he had conceived in his mind? Anakin took a deep breath, preventing another surge of anxiety from spreading throughout his body. He looked at Ahsoka and told her that he believed a rift within the Order would prevent them from crumbling in on themselves. His young Padawan was in complete disbelief. Was Anakin seriously suggesting they break apart the Jedi Order? That wasn't even necessarily plausible, was it? Ahsoka questioned Anakin if he was even sound in the mind when he concocted such a plan. He nodded his head. He told her that he believed it would be the best step forward, and he wanted her thoughts on it. Not that she could deter her master from doing it, he was far too stubborn for that, but maybe she'd say something that would resonate with him or for him and a system on this path. Ahsoka looked at the ground, too many thoughts in her mind, so she turned to her master and asked him, what did he really want to accomplish? Anakin thought for a moment. He told Ahsoka that he wanted to restore the Jedi to what they say they are, but no longer stand for, and so Ahsoka asked what that would be. Anakin told her that they were warriors, not peacekeepers, marshals, not knights, liars, not truth seekers, politicians, not free from bias. Ahsoka told Anakin that if those were the truths he believed about the Jedi Order, then he should revoke those ideas in front of other Jedi. If he wanted to voice his feelings, then why not do something bold? Anakin knew everyone knew who he was. He was on billboards across the galaxy, he was the face of the Republic war effort, and he was also the chosen one. Every single Jedi knew exactly who he was. Anakin's also a natural leader, but the gravity of this particular situation was putting him on edge. Frankly, not much bothered him, but he was still human, and he couldn't deny that the idea of overthrowing the Council was a stressful idea. Anakin truthfully didn't believe there were any Jedi that would back him, aside from his student. Anakin thanked Ahsoka, and she nodded her head and left the room. Anakin laid back on his bed and put some calm sounds on. It was a mix of music and a touch of realistic nature sounds. He listened to them and began speaking to himself, taking a simple idea and building around it, giving it a foundation and a structure and allowing it to take on a life of its own. He carried on and on, telling himself this and that, and then he rose. His mind was lost amongst the stars, trapped in a sea of sound surrounding him, and he finally got it. The words he was looking for. He didn't need to write them down, he had them all in his head. He would recite them as if he was reading from a prompter, but he would speak to the Jedi from the heart. It was close to the middle of the night on Coruscant by this time. He'd gone all day thinking about this, and now he had a moment, so he would capture it. As he left his room and made his way for the archives, his thoughts varied. Some of them were regretful, some of them were fears biting away at him, but the most prevalent voice was reassuring him that the most growth happens when he is uncomfortable, a true testament to taking the risk of a lifetime. He could and would very likely be thrown from the Jedi Order, but he wouldn't care, he needed to say it. He wouldn't stand for this any longer. When he got to the archives, there was not a soul present, so he made his way for the hollow drives and opened them up. He'd be able to send a message to every single Jedi inside the Jedi Order. It'd be sent, and they would all get it around the same time. What a brilliant plan. Anakin opened up the hollow wall and pressed on a couple of keys before taking a deep breath. A triple beep sounded and he began his little ramble that started as such. This is Anakin Skywalker, Jedi Knight inside the Jedi Order, and General inside the Grand Army of the Republic. I have come to tell you that the Council has lied to all of us, and it's time for them to renounce their rule over the Order. During my time as a Jedi, I've seen great change, and as many of you have learned the same lessons as I, we have come to realize that this Order is a shell of what it once was, a long time ago, before any of us were alive. 
We as Jedi are meant to be peacekeepers, and yet we sustain the war. We as Jedi are meant to be liberators, yet the crime families rule over the Outer Rim. We as Jedi are meant to be Knights of the Republic, and yet we hold nothing but militaristic titles and send our Padawans off to the clutches of war. I'm not suggesting we surrender to the Separatists, but I am suggesting that the Jedi Council step down from their seats over the Order. Many on the Council are influenced by a complacent Grand Master, and many of us simply accept the lies that are being told to us by the Council. I believe we can change the outcome of our own history, as long as we have the courage to believe. To those of you that wish to join me in our historic endeavor, may the Force be with us. Anakin tapped the button on the Council, and the message ended. He took a deep breath. The system started to load the message, and Anakin looked down at the hall. It was a bit dim, but he felt a surreal amount of peace cover his body. Maybe he'd saved the Jedi Order from this destruction, or maybe he encouraged their downfall. Anakin stumbled over his thoughts, realizing he forgot to say something, the one thing he was planning on saying. He knew he would forget it, especially on the walk over here. It was like a bet he made to himself. But at the very least, this message was coherent, so it's very plausible that the intended message would come across understood. After a short minute, the message was finished processing, and then it was subsequently sent out across the galaxy. Anakin stepped back and started for the exit. Where he was, he wasn't technically supposed to be, but who cares at this point? He walked out of the archives and made his way back towards his room. Anakin didn't realize it, but he had sent it out to not just every communication device, but every system in the order. So the speakers laid out across the temple for public announcements, for example, would shout out his spiel. Anakin realized that, and at the last second he ran back into the archives to ensure that didn't happen. Anakin wasn't going to play stupid. He could deter allies by waking them up in the middle of the night. Of course, that was nothing more than superstition, but he didn't want to push his luck. Anakin made his way back to his room and quieted himself down. Part of him wanted to stay up all night until the morning came. The rest of him didn't. He was exhausted anyways, so he slowly drifted down into a deep sleep. When he woke up, he completely forgot about what he did. That is, until he told whoever was banging on his door to come in. It was Obi-Wan, and he looked very grumpy. Anakin asked what Obi-Wan was upset about, and he pulled out the transmission that was sent to the entire Jedi Order. Anakin was thrown back into the memory from the previous night. He looked at Obi-Wan, and then back at the hologram. He said it himself, and told Obi-Wan that is how he felt. Trying to put more confidence into himself, he told Obi-Wan that there was a genuine corruption, and he believed the Council should step down. Kenobi was very disappointed, and he told Anakin that he could rescind those words right now. And still, it was early morning. Many Jedi inside the temple likely hadn't seen it. He could fix this entire issue. Anakin swung his legs over the side of the bed and shook his head. He pulled a sleeve over his metallic arm and lifted the robes around his shirt. Anakin looked over at Obi-Wan as he stood up and told him that it was time for change. Obi-Wan told his former student that this wouldn't end the way he wanted it to. Anakin shook his head, pointing his finger at his former master and telling him that if he didn't want this, then maybe he shouldn't have breached their trust, continuing in saying that the council didn't need to tell him everything, but faking his death was too far. Anakin stopped. He lowered his finger and told Obi-Wan that he was very happy he was still alive, but it didn't mean he forgave him for what he did. He was very upset with it, and he and the Council should be appalled by their own actions. Obi-Wan rebuted that it was in the protection of the Chancellor. Anakin blasted back and asked what all that lying accomplished. Dooku wasn't captured. The few bounty hunters would break out or be broken out again. Nothing changed. In a few short months, everything would go back to the way it was, and the war would still be going on. Anakin stepped out of his room and walked into the hallway. People were starting to get up, but Anakin got a communication request saying that he'd come to the High Council chambers. He stopped. He took a deep breath and made his way there. In the elevator, he quietly and even awkwardly waited with Obi-Wan. When the doors opened, they both entered the council chambers and Obi-Wan took a seat. Anakin turned to face the Master of the Order and the Grand Master. Everyone gathered up inside the chambers for the meeting. Typically, Masters on the council were up anyways. Yoda spoke to Anakin directly, expressing his disappointment with Anakin's decisions and how they could sow nothing but divide into the Order. Anakin suggested that maybe the Order needed a little bit of divide. Maybe change could only happen if the council saw what they were doing. Mundi from across the chamber shot up and asked what was so wrong with what the Jedi were doing. Anakin turned to him and told him that what he was concerned about was in the message. Kiari Moody wasn't through with this answer. It was very sassy. Mace asked Anakin what the purpose for all of this was. He told the council that he was tired of being lied to. He was tired of being a Jedi but not being a Jedi. Plo asked Anakin what he meant by that statement. Anakin continued and told the council that he had a mission on Zygeria. There were slavers on that planet. He grew up on Tatooine as a slave. Why didn't that change? They had nearly 12 years since he'd been in the Order and nothing remotely changed on any of those fronts. Anakin told the Council that the war only distanced the Order from a code they apparently held so close and dear to themselves. How was he expected to follow the code if the Jedi couldn't maintain the peace? Yoda expressed that it wasn't the first time war had happened. The Jedi aren't omnipresent. So Anakin asked why they acted as such. Or even better than that, why did the Jedi choose a side? 
Windu asked Anakin if it was he and the Republic Senator who got captured from Genosis. Obi-Wan suggested that Anakin was going too far with this one. Anakin may have had issues with the faking of Obi-Wan's death, but it should have been seen as a greater lesson in overcoming adversity and letting go. Yoda stopped all the discussions and told Anakin that his actions could be reversed if he apologized in a message to the Jedi Order. He would face proper punishment, but he could at the very least make things right. Anakin shook his head. Jedi Mundi told Anakin that he was no longer welcome inside the Jedi Order. Anakin turned his head. Many of the other Jedi in the room did so as well. Anakin didn't budge, so he told the Jedi Master that his actions have caused much disgrace that was brought into this Jedi Order. Anakin told the Council that he only asked they step down so a new generation may lead the Order, being that they could not see how their own actions were causing a rift. Then there was no saving the Jedi if they didn't. Anakin turned and stepped out of the room. Kedimundi asked if there were any other Jedi in the room that felt the same. Master Plo Koon stood up. He looked over his brothers and sisters in the room and he told them that the Council failed its mandate to the Jedi. The code wasn't being followed and the Jedi were warmongering. It was time to stop playing politics. From the corner of the room, two more Jedi stood up. Eith Koth, and next to him, Depa Balaba. They told the council that they agreed. Depa suggested that not everything was as black and white as Anakin laid it out, but the deeper issues mentioned were tearing the fabric of what it meant to be a Jedi apart. On the other side of the room, Adi Gallia, Kit Fisto, and Shock T stood up. They agreed, suggesting that while not everything was under their control, their hypocrisy was something they only continued to perpetuate in the years prior to the Clone Wars, playing too close to the Republic and becoming reliant on its leaders. Plo Koon moved to the door and waited for his fellow brothers and sisters to join him. He turned back and suggested that maybe Master Scyther Deez had a point, and while Dooku went too far, maybe he was ahead of his time. The Jedi should have changed after Dooku left and after Yaddle stepped down from the High Council. The six Jedi left the room and silence rolled over the remaining council members. Plo and the other five entered the elevator and were sent down to the bottom of the temple. They asked each other what was next, and Plo told them that they should see what the Order says. If they no longer support the council, then maybe they could resolve this issue, but it was reliant on what the order itself believed. The remaining council began to discuss the implications of losing the number of its members. Master Opa Rancisis suggested that everyone who didn't agree with the council should be ousted from the order. May suggested that that wasn't necessary. To do that would only further the disunion. They didn't want the Sith to become aware of the break in the system. Obi-Wan suggested they allow it to simmer down. Likely Anakin's words wouldn't encourage an uprising within the order. Mundi backed that statement, reminding the other members how repulsive Skywalker could become. Obi-Wan didn't agree with the sentiment, but he sided with the Council in this matter. He personally believed that what he did was for the betterment of the Republic. Going undercover in the way he did wasn't meant as a personal offense to Anakin, he just needed to stop seeing it as such. As the six council members got down to the bottom, the door opened and they saw Anakin surrounded by a number of Jedi. Ahsoka was right there with them. Many Jedi saw the message, and many of them agreed with it. Jedi across the galaxy on numerous battlefronts saw the message, but didn't really know what to do with the information. The Jedi all came to find Anakin, and when he exited the chambers, they all surrounded him, asking him what had happened. He was very surprised by the response from his fellow Jedi, but the truth is, there was more than just him that wanted this, to dispose of the system set in place to rise against the autocracy of the Council. Not everyone believed as sternly as Dooku did, but Anakin's delivery was peaceful, considerate, and it didn't push people away. He did something Dooku never could, which was open up a peaceful discourse. There were many Jedi on the fence, but a lot of Jedi who believed as Anakin did joined him. They told Anakin that despite the Council pushing him from the Order, they didn't want him to leave. He was the face of the Republic. The Jedi couldn't reasonably lose him. Anakin felt a lot of admiration, and when the doors opened behind him, he looked back and saw the six Jedi. He was confused. Had they come to reprimand him? Plo spoke up for the group, informing Anakin that despite some of the motives, the collective group overall agreed with his direction and his feelings on the matter. Anakin smiled and told them that he appreciated them for believing in him. The former council members told Anakin that there was no reason for him to leave the Jedi Order. Things needed to change within the Jedi Order, and it had been at a tipping point for decades. The reality is, the Grand Master was the problem with the Order. Yoda did care about the Jedi, and he was a true Jedi. However, he had become complacent. He lived for nearly 900 years, and he spent more than half of that time as a leader of the Jedi Order and the Grand Master. Generations of Jedi had considered him the wisest of all the Jedi, and while he was wise, he was no longer evolving. Rather, he was just accepting of the status quo, which is something this new generation of Jedi could no longer accept. While Plo was certainly not a part of this new generation, he sided with the general gist of what Anakin was going for. Obi-Wan would have too, had he not seen this as a part of overreaction on Anakin's part. Anakin turned to Plo and asked what they should do. 
and Plo shook his head. He placed his hand on Anakin's shoulder, informing him that the questions he needed answers to had to come from within him. Plo was passing the reins to Anakin. He may have been 300 some years old, but Plo knew that this revolution, schism, or whatever it was called had to come from the one who propelled it into existence. If it came from him or any of the other council members, it would feel fraudulent and more like a power grab. While Anakin had his supporters, there were also those who completely despised Anakin for what he said. He crossed the line several times, but this was a step too far. He needed to be put in his place and stopped. The remaining council discussed how they should handle the situation, ease the tension, and inform the Jedi of what had happened. But like they had in many years, they would just try and brush it under the carpet with all the other skeletons. The systematic flaws within the Jedi Order had been exposed, and it was only a matter of time until this exposure led to the crumbling of the system. Hours would pass by since Anakin removed himself from the Jedi Order. Debate had stretched its way across the Jedi Temple. Many Jedi were talking about it and debating what should be done. Many agreed with Anakin, believing that the Order had fallen into a place it needed to get out of, while many others countered it and suggested that the Jedi needed to continue being who they've always been. This never got much further than debate, however the tension within the temple was rising. Jedi would come and go from the battlefront, and the tension was almost like a battlefield. Anakin stayed hidden as the council members who stepped down announced their siding with Anakin on this, and suggested that maybe change was necessary for the betterment of the Order. The council, on the other hand, continued to believe that the Jedi would be fine, and that they didn't need to intermingle with their peers to ensure their loyalty. They assumed that everyone would see this as another time Anakin crossed the line, and being that they just figured Anakin would just walk out of the order once he was removed, they had no reason to believe anything would come from this. It wasn't entirely false either. Anakin wasn't talking to anyone, instead he was staying in his room, trying to figure out ways he could place the Jedi into a better place. If he had a voice of resistance and he needed to have a firm grip on his feelings towards the matter, Anakin had to have every single talking point for his cause stuck in his mind. He had to know it like the back of his hand. He now understood why his anxiety was so present when he first thought of this idea. He knew it could take a lot out of him, and he knew it could throw him down for a loop. He would have to face it now, and he would have to be the strongest he'd ever been. Anakin would stay isolated for a number of days. Tensions began to tighten around the Order. Anakin hadn't been seen, but many people started to see his peaceful demeanor and see it as the right way to handle this. If Anakin had gone about this in a more Anakin way, then this wouldn't have ever gone in his favor, and it would have burned up and died in his hands. The council members who still remained requested to speak with each of their former peers individually to ask and see why they stepped down from the council, and Plo Koon, Adi Galia, Depa Balaba, Kit Fisto, Eeth Koth, and Shock T all had the same general consensus. The Jedi had fallen too far down the Sarlacc pit, and it was time for real change to be issued into the Order. Of course, each of them had their own reasons for siding with Anakin, but that was besides the point. This could have one of two different effects on the High Council. It could make them see their own wronging and make up for it, or it could close them off more. It did the latter. After a number of days, Anakin would emerge from his room and would be greeted with both open arms and cold looks of disgust. He knew this had come, and he was willing to accept the role he put himself into. Anakin walked through the halls and found a conglomerate of Jedi talking with each other in the Great Hall. Standing out of the group was Master Plo, Shock T, and Kit Fisto. They were all watching, and they saw Anakin. They all came over to greet him and asked him how he was doing. He told them that he was unsure of what he had done, but he had his ideas together and he was ready to approach his peers with a general plan of what they wanted to accomplish. Things that needed to change within the Order and about the Order. They were proud of him. Anakin turned his head as many of the other Jedi had quieted down and started looking at him opening a space for him to walk between them and speak his mind. The entire revolution relied on Anakin's ability to say what needed to be said in the most appropriate way. Plo noticed Anakin's unbalance and placed his arm around his back and pulled him to his side. He turned his head to Skywalker and told him that fate rarely calls upon us in a moment of our choosing. The path laid before him was by the will of the Force. Let it guide him. Anakin smiled and nodded his head and started walking forward. As Anakin did so, he heard his name called from the side and he turned to see a Jedi Master. It was Kiarimundi. He left his throne inside the top of the castle. He demanded that Skywalker cease his actions and leave the Jedi Temple as per requested. He was no longer welcome here. Anakin looked at the other Jedi. Some of them were on the fence about their decision to support Anakin or not, and Kiarimundi was pushing them away from supporting the Order. Anakin turned his body towards Mundi and asked that he respect him and his peers. Mundi told him that if they aligned themselves with Skywalker, they would no longer be considered Jedi and would be forcibly removed from the Jedi Temple. Jedi who weren't fully decided feared the idea of being forced out of the Order, and so their lean was towards Mundi's side. This was until Skywalker shook his head and told Mundi that that would not happen. The Jedi Council member put his hand on his belt and told Anakin that this was his final warning to take his band of rebels with him and leave the Jedi Order. 
for once. Anakin didn't budge, and so Kiarimundi escalated the situation by igniting his lightsaber. Most of the Jedi hadn't expected this, but Anakin trusted the words of Plo, the ones that had just been said to him, and he ignited his own lightsaber. Anakin and Mundi stood on opposite sides from each other, but the sound of lightsabers got people's attention. Before anything happened, a number of council supporters rounded the corner and ignited their weapons, showing their support for Mundi and the council. They all told Anakin he was outmatched. It was time to leave. Kit Fisto walked forward, trying to stop it, but Plo put his hand on his shoulder and shook his head. Whatever was going to happen was escalated because of the council. It needed to be seen as such. Anakin told Mundi that he wasn't afraid of these odds. This may have been a bit arrogant, but the Jedi with him all ignited their weapons. Anakin told Mundi that this didn't need to happen like this. From across the catwalk, Master Opa Rancisa spoke up, trying to pin the blame on Anakin as he ignited his own lightsaber. Behind him, another group of council loyalists ignited their weapons. Anakin stood at the crossroads here. He was stuck between two council members and a number of Jedi council loyalists. The grouping of Jedi that Anakin was about to speak to had all ignited their weapons. Most of them were with Anakin, while others who were on the fence now sided with him. Because of Mundi and Racis' decision to start a potential fight, the few of them that continued to side with the council stood surrounded. The escalation had Fisto, Shock, T, and Plo ignited their weapons as well, but keeping their distance. Hopefully Anakin could resolve this without a battle happening inside these hollowed halls. Anakin pointed his blade forward and told the council members that they escalated the situation but they didn't see it that way. Mundi told Anakin that his final warning had expired and the Jedi Master rushed forward. Anakin was shocked to say the least, but he moved out of the way, dodging the strike. The other Jedi didn't know what to do, but they followed suit, rushing towards each other, their weapons ignited, some of them genuinely going for the kill, while others had no intention of hurting their brothers or sisters. Anakin spun around and blocked a strike from Master Rancisis. Mundi turned back before he was thrown from his feet by the Force. Plo was standing across from Anakin, before ducking under a swing made by another Jedi. He turned back around and slammed his blade into another Jedi's blade. Anakin blocked a number of strikes from coming at him. It was chaos, and the bubbling point came to a head here. As the sounds of blades ensued, the sound of a body dropping silenced the battle. All the Jedi turned when a young Jedi Knight cried out in agony. His former master had been slain. Her lifeless corpse laid on the ground. She supported Anakin, and the man who killed her supported the council. There was a shock for everyone the moment it happened, and the young Jedi Knight threw his blade upwards into the jaw of the man who killed his master. The Jedi all resumed the fight. The possibility of death became all too real in this moment. Lightsabers began clashing and the Jedi were at war with each other. Anakin moved his blade, trying not to hurt or kill anyone, but he soon began to realize that peaceful negotiations were no longer an option. He needed to defend himself. A Jedi ran at him and Anakin swiftly cut their arm off before continuing the fight against Master Rancisis. Plo Koon and Kiarimundi got into a heated exchange. Change. Plo was trying to avoid this turning into a deadly conflict, and in the moment, he now realized the true toxicity of the council. It was embodied in two of his lifetime members, Kerimundi and Opa Rancisis. Skywalker felt the same. He didn't want to harm Ropo, but he was left with no choice. Opa wasn't someone to mess around with. He was speedy and he was experienced. As Jedi continued to drop dead around the duel, Anakin used his strength to disarm Oppo before cutting off both of his hands and using the force to throw him into a pillar. Anakin turned around when he heard his name called out. It was Obi-Wan. Ahsoka ran to Skywalker's side and she looked at Kenobi. He told Anakin it was time to stop this. It was like a calm in the storm. Duels spread out across the temple. Of course, the younglings were safe, but the council loyalists and the revolutionists were not stopping in the name of peace. They were engaging heavily. Anakin told Obi-Wan it didn't need to come to this. Obi-Wan couldn't believe that Anakin would have started this fight. Of course, Obi-Wan was blind to what Kiarimundi had done, but all Obi-Wan saw was Anakin cutting off Opo's hands and throwing him into a pillar. He wasn't exactly under the belief that the council member started such a fight. Anakin told his master that he wasn't backing down from what was right, so he moved his blade into his signature stance, and Obi-Wan ignited his own blade. The two of them looked at each other, as Anakin told Ahsoka to go. This was their fight. Anakin definitely didn't want to hurt Obi-Wan. He knew it wasn't his fault for trusting the will of the council, and he didn't want to believe he lost his best friend to the will of the council. Anakin and Obi-Wan rushed for each other. Their blades clashing was heard around the temple. As fights got heavier, the council members converged on each other. Kid Fisto, Depa Balaba, and Adi Galia came across Mace Windu's squad, just without him. It was Agon Kolar and Stacey Tin. Fisto knew these duelists wouldn't be easy. At the same time, Shock T assisted Plo Koon with his fight against Kiari Mundi. They both realized Mundi wouldn't stop. The fight was horrendous, and then the Jedi Master of the Order and the Grand Master entered the fray. They couldn't believe it, both of them assuming, as Obi-Wan had, that Anakin started this conflict. They looked for him, but they couldn't, as they were both approached by a number of Jedi who joined Anakin. Their blades crashed down to defend themselves. Anakin and Obi-Wan were a sight to behold. If people weren't defending themselves, they had their eyes locked 
on this show of strength. Years of brotherhood laid out in the balance right here. Anakin held his patience and resolve. He wasn't angry and he wasn't using his anger. He was trying to hold everything together before it fell apart. They carried out their duel, neither of them gaining an upper hand. At the same time, Barriss and Ahsoka met up. It was right after Barriss gutted Luminara. She couldn't stand her master. Ahsoka was trying to avoid the killing of these Jedi, but some of the Jedi were seriously out for blood. Across the catwalk, Plo defended a strike from Mundi before slicing his blade forward and cutting through his chest. Plo held out his hand and shocked he grabbed Plo's shoulder, reassuring him that this was Kiari Mundi's choice. Plo didn't want to or mean to kill Mundi. They had been friendly for years, but she was right. Mundi started this and it was his penance. His body fell to the ground and as it did, an amethyst glow took over their attention. Windu was ashamed. He told the two of them that they betrayed the Jedi Order. They disagreed, suggesting that they were protecting what little remained and a duel began. Yoda was moving through the ground of Jedi revolutionists, dispatching people's lightsabers to stop their fight, until he came across Kid Fisto, Ari Galia, Depa Balaba, and Eeth Kaw. They dispatched Ag and Kolar and Sezi Tin, without killing them, and they were confronting Yoda to ensure he didn't continue his fight any longer. They didn't want to kill him either. Anakin and Obi-Wan pulled at each other, several times interlocking their hands as their duel got more fierce. But as much of a master as Obi-Wan was of Form 3, Anakin got the best of him. Slashing his blade upwards and throwing Obi-Wan from his balance, Anakin couldn't hurt him, so he did what he could to avoid it, throwing his boot into Obi-Wan's stomach and kicking him off of his feet. Anakin held his blade down at Obi-Wan and told him he never wanted to hurt him. Hopefully he could see what his actions in supporting the Council were doing to the Jedi Order. Anakin came around the corner, looking to help out where he could. The battle was intense, and there were hundreds, maybe thousands of dead Jedi strewn around the temple. Anakin ran up and found Mace Windu fighting Plo Koon and Shakti. The duel was tense. Windu was an incredible duelist, and Anakin assumed they would be able to handle themselves. That is until Anakin saw the Grand Master himself. Yoda stood with his lightsaber in his hands. He was very displeased. He told Anakin that he made a mistake by doing what he did. Yoda beat the four Jedi that approached him. It was hard work, but he still did it. As Yoda stood in front of Anakin, a number of Jedi started to line up with Anakin. Some of them were knights, others were Padawans, and the rest were masters. Anakin's revolutionists were winning this battle, and these Jedi were standing against Yoda. Anakin didn't turn his head. He could just feel them coming to his aid. He told Yoda and Windu that it was time for them to stand down. It was time to surrender their seats on the High Council for a new future of the Jedi. Plo and shocked, he broke off and held their blades out in front of them. Yoda and Windu got back to back with each other. Obi-Wan looked over from where he was as he saw Ahsoka move to Anakin's side. He looked down at the carnage around him and thought about what had happened, what had gone so wrong. Maybe Anakin didn't start it. Right now, he didn't seem eager to fight the other Jedi. He seemed so much more disappointed that it had to come to this. Anakin broke the silence in the air. Of course, there were the sounds of a couple other duels going around in the Great Hall, but for the most part, on the cakewalk where the Jedi were facing off, with each other, it was silent. Anakin told the Master of the Order and the Grand Master that all this death was never what he wanted. Anakin suggested that he came to talk to the other Jedi today, to affirm his points, to suggest possibilities of change within the Order, to encourage a new beginning for the Jedi, and Kiari Mundi threatened him. Anakin continued saying that he only drew his blade to defend himself. The people loyal to the Council encouraged the battle to ensue, and now there were hundreds, maybe thousands of dead Jedi. It didn't have to end like this. They didn't have to continue the bloodshed. Yoda pointed his blade forward, telling Skywalker that his revolution caused all this death. His need to cause ripples within the Order caused this destruction. Anakin shook his head. He dignified his lightsaber. Anakin didn't want to become a martyr by any means, but he knew what he had to do. Anakin surrendered himself up, telling Yoda that the choice was now his. Step down or kill him. Anakin handed his lightsaber to Ahsoka as she asked what he was doing. Skywalker stepped out from the crowd of Jedi, all of them silent as they watched the Chosen One step to the middle of the catwalk and get down on his knees. Anakin gave Yoda two choices. One choice would result in the restoration of his Jedi Order. The other choice would result in the restoration of the true Jedi Order. If he killed Anakin, the Loyalists could probably rise up. But if he stepped down, then he'd be surrendering the Council to the other Jedi. Yoda didn't want the Order to split, so instead, he deignited his weapon. He told Anakin that he didn't want the Jedi Order to fall into halves. He didn't want a schism to tear apart the fabric of the Jedi Order. So Yoda stepped down. He told the Jedi present that no more death should befall this Order. His own errors had led them far from their path, and he turned around. Yoda felt great despair as Windu watched the former Grand Master walk away in defeat. The Jedi all looked at each other in confusion. The fighting slowly stopped and Anakin looked up. A wave of shock filled his body. He surrendered himself to death, to the Force, and the Force rewarded him with euphoria. What now? He never expected to get as far as he did. What does he do now? Anakin turned around and looked at the Jedi he led here, the lightsabers all deigniting. 
Was the Jedi Civil War just that? Anakin got to his feet and looked at the death around. A level of shock filled his body. He looked at the other Jedi and told them, all of them, that a new era could only begin if they came together, right now. They had to become one with themselves before they could resolve what was wrong with the Order. Now that they ended the rupture within the Order, they could begin on unifying. Anakin looked over at Obi-Wan, who was still on the ground, and he made his way over to him and asked him if he was alright. Obi-Wan nodded his head, but he didn't say much else in regards to it. Over the coming hours, every dead Jedi would be taken to the morgue and be buried in one large ceremony of remembrance. Yoda became a ghost. His face vanished. Windu, on the other hand, helped clean up and bury the bodies. The hours slowly drifted into days, many Jedi not knowing how to really understand what had just happened inside the temple, how to explain away all of what they'd just seen. It was horrific, what they just did to each other, and surely the Sith Lord knew. At the very least, the Chancellor was uninformed. Anakin, in reality, didn't want to take the mantle as the Grand Master, but it was the only role he legitimately fall into now. He took the Order, ripped it apart, and told the entire Order that the Council was unfit to have jurisdiction over the Order. He won that battle, and now he had to do what was better. He had to prove that the Jedi could be taken to a better place and handle the war better than previously done. This left Anakin with a little bit of a bind. He was incredibly loyal to his men in the 501st, but he knew the war itself was against everything the Jedi stood for. If he continued the war, he would label himself as a hypocrite and a liar, and the chances are everything would bubble over again. Anakin didn't like politics to begin with, so start there. When the burial ceremonies were finished, Anakin approached Jocasta Nu about this issue. She's very much so on the side of the council, but she was now left with having to assist Skywalker. But Anakin came looking for information, and as the archivist, she had to provide it in some form. Anakin stepped up and asked for information regarding different time periods of the Jedi Order. The religion itself had existed for more than 25,000 years. Maybe there was something Anakin could learn from the past. He learned of another Jedi Civil War in the Jedi's history. He also learned about different eras of the Jedi and how they interacted with the Republic. What the Jedi were doing now was their most toxic relationship with politics. Instead of it being Sith versus Jedi, it was Jedi versus people, and that could not be. So, Anakin openly told the Jedi Order that they would be removing themselves from the war effort, relinquishing their roles as generals and commanders within the Grand Army of the Republic, and completely separating themselves from the government of the Republic. Their new goal was to end the war as fast as possible, and with a neutral stance, they had unlimited access to either side. While the Separatists didn't initially bite the bullet, it actually worked, though no one was more caught off by this than Palpatine himself. He couldn't believe it, to be honest. He never imagined Yoda stepping down and giving Anakin the role of Grand Master. However, this proved to be an issue for Palpatine. Now his future pupil was more of a Jedi than ever before. He wasn't just a Jedi, he was the Jedi. He was the one every single Jedi in the Order looked up to, and he had to confront this issue head on. Anakin's public statement sent ripples to the galaxy. The Jedi severed several centuries worth of a bond with the Republic, but there was a provided rationale. So before people got up in arms about the Jedi being traitors or turning their backs on the Republic, Anakin told the galaxy that the Jedi were established to serve everyone, not just the Republic, and so now it would be their current mandate to issue peace to the galaxy. People across the galaxy, for the most part, saw this as positive. Of course, there were those people, loyalists to the Republic, who didn't like it, and some people part of the Separatists felt the same. But the general consensus across the board was bringing peace to the galaxy as a means to end the Clone Wars. Anakin didn't want to appoint a council. He also didn't want to put all the weight on his shoulders, so instead he requested for assistance in different areas of what he was trying to accomplish, asking certain masters he trusted to work on constructing a new image for the Jedi in one area, or asking for Jedi to go to another planet for something else. Anakin also continued his deep dive into information on the Jedi. Without being a general, he didn't need to be off Coruscant all the time, and not for nothing, his master, the negotiator, was out doing most of the negotiating. The Jedi who were actively pursuing peace around the galaxy, and especially on Raxus, was Obi-Wan, Fisto, Shakti, and Plo Koon, all appointed by Anakin. This renouncing of the Republic meant the Jedi, including Anakin, had no business being at the Republic Executive Building or the Senate Building on Coruscant without stated approval from a number of Senators. This was because of Palpatine. Luckily, there were a number of Senators that were already friends with the Jedi. This had Windu, Depa Balaba, and Adi Gallia inside the Republic Senate Building and the Republic Executive Building relaying information back to the Jedi on Raxus. While all this was going on, there was a little event transpiring in the Outer Rim. Without the Jedi being involved with Maul, he was able to capture Hondo and Naka's men and take them on as his own. Hondo barely escaped alive, but this left Maul without information to see Mandalore as weak. He never interacted with the Death Watch, and he also believed he could begin his little criminal empire with a growing band of pirates. 
the galaxy also saw how important the Jedi were to the active battlefront, and the Republic began losing some of its battles that should have been won. It wasn't every battle, and it's not like Jedi were superheroes, but for the most part they were dearly missed by the clones. Having a Jedi really did help on the battlefront, and now without the Jedi, it was a bit more of a struggle for the clones of the Republic. As this was going on, Anakin began making changes to the code, seeing things that didn't make sense, especially in the context of how they were framed, by the ancient Jedi of course. Anakin's rebellious desire made him change aspects of the code that would better assist the Jedi as a whole. Anakin made the restricted section accessible to anyone who reached the rank of Jedi Knight. He made it so that the code no longer forbade attachments. He increased the age limit for new members to be in the Order. He also encouraged the usage of the Force as a whole. The rank of Jedi Knight rule allowed every Jedi, aside from children, to access the restricted section. He also made everything that was hidden by the Council visible to every Knight and up. The forbidden attachments change was relatively self-explanatory, however Anakin didn't reveal his relationship after changing that rule. Lastly, the encouragement of the Force didn't mean using the dark side. Anakin believed what Qui-Gon believed, which was Qui-Gon went to the light because it was there. Anakin believed that if the light was there, then it should be followed. However, with a touch of inspiration for Windu, the usage of the dark side in mediation could be very useful. While Anakin typically did go far into the dark, he saw this addition to the code as something for himself to work on. Since he began his little revolution, he had to mature a lot. He had to stop with the tantrums and angry spells, so using this addition to the code, he could better himself as a Jedi. With the Jedi in the spotlight of the peace talks, all the pressure shifted over to the Separatist Senate, the Republic Senate, Count Dooku, and Chancellor Palpatine. This was obviously not a part of their plan, but it did become one of the many things that could go wrong in the plan to force the galaxy into a war. It turns out people just typically don't like death, and a galaxy-wide war may have sown disunion, but with the assistance of the Jedi, Jedi allowed Unity to have a chance to shine through. Palpatine knew just as much as Dooku did that this could throw off their plans entirely and have forced them to restructure everything. If they couldn't fix this, then they would be defeated by the Jedi once and for all. Palpatine and Dooku had to forge something to make their distaste for peace seem realistic. It's not the first time the Republic was on the cusp of peace, however, the last time it was stopped by Grievous. So, Dooku decided that he would send General Grievous to Raxus to hopefully kill the four Jedi and stop the peace talks. Long story short, didn't work. General Grievous may have been extremely talented, but he wouldn't beat two Jedi he previously lost to, plus two other extremely talented Jedi. With Grievous destroyed, the Jedi suggested to the Separatists that there was someone else behind this, and while Dooku tried to show a sense of interest in the peace talks, most of the Separatist Senate could tell that it was fabricated. The people wanted peace, and it seemed like Dooku was interfering. Also, it didn't help that people in Serena were tired of Dooku exploiting them. Palpatine knew he had to make his magic work, and so he called upon Anakin, who at this point still kept a friendly bond with Palpatine, but more or less didn't have time for it. Anakin was micromanaging a little bit, and he was very intent on bringing peace back to the galaxy. Palpatine suggested that maybe the Jedi were holding back the process. After all, Anakin wasn't involved, so maybe he would buy it. He didn't. Anakin told Palpatine that all he wanted was peace. If Palpatine didn't want the peace, then maybe he should allow someone else to fill his shoes. Anakin may have been a little outspoken, but he had to be. So in turn, Palpatine twisted it. He knew with Anakin as Grand Master, he likely wouldn't be able to turn him to the dark side now. Palpatine tried to deface the Jedi Order by suggesting that in a private call, Anakin threatened Palpatine to step down from his office. It was a political ploy that would eat away at headlines, taking people's focus away from the reality of the peace accords. Though this didn't exactly work on Anakin. See, he saw this political move as nothing short of political, and so Anakin consolidated in an unlikely ally, Mace Windu. The two of them eased tensions after the little civil war. They weren't super friendly, but they kept up the status quo. Anakin knew that if anyone might have a response to this, it could be and would be Mace Windu. Anakin consulted Mace because he believed that the former Master of the Order might have some insight on how to handle this thing with Palpatine, accusing him. All Mace had to say was, stay the course. That's all he could do. Actions spoke louder than words. Rumors were all they were. If the Chancellor intended on breaking the Jedi, then he was just exposing himself as a fraudulent politician. Anakin thanked Windu for the information, and then he asked if Windu had seen Yoda, and he shook his head. He told Mace that he hadn't seen Yoda in a while, and so he figured he might as well ask. Windu told Anakin that he was likely meditating, but that was far from the truth. Anakin and Windu went their separate ways. As the peace treaties were being set up, the battles across the galaxy began to slow down. During this time, Anakin would continue his teachings to Ahsoka and helping her through her development. However, she was at a point where she would likely be able to move on from being a Jedi Padawan, and Anakin knew it. He would welcome that opportunity for her once the war was over and dealt with. Anakin had been keeping close in contact with Padme, 
through these events and while he admitted that the code was changed, he felt like he put too much pressure on himself. She told him that he expected too much from himself, and that wasn't exactly something new, he always did. She reminded him that he was strong, but he's only one person. To not allow the place of power he held make him lose touch with himself. Anakin thanked her for her words of wisdom and returned to diplomacy. Palpatine knew he couldn't do anything in this state aside from Order 66, however that wouldn't do anything for him. The Jedi went a high alert, and the clones weren't anywhere near the Jedi, it would just expose him as the Sith Lord. So he needed another means to play this out, and instead of fighting it, he told Dooku that they would bite the bullet and return to Morban, considering that once the war was over, the people in Sereno would likely remove Dooku from any sort of power. As power-hungry as Sidious could be, he knew the Sith had to survive, no matter what. Sure, his plan didn't come to fruition, but he could possibly concoct another one. So, thanks to the Jedi, the Clone Wars came to a conclusion. There were some Separatists that were disjointed with the entire situation and woke up choosing violence, which ended up costing each and every single one of them their lives. While this was transpiring, the Jedi returned to the temple to memorialize a fallen Jedi. Former Grandmaster Yoda had passed away in his sleep. The reality of the situation is that he felt a great level of pain for what he had allowed to happen. Yoda for the longest time believed he was continuing the established legacy of the Jedi. He thought he was helping, and in reality, he was only hurting the Jedi Order as a whole. He felt a great disappointment for it, and he couldn't get over the burden. Yoda didn't realize he led the Order so far astray from its roots, and such a disappointment hurt him, and did indeed cause him to move on from the living. Yoda held no resentments towards Anakin or his actions. In reality, he made a hollow recording for the new Grand Master. Anakin didn't see it until after the funeral, but it brought him to tears. Anakin took the recording to his room and listened to it. Yoda told the story of not just his life, but his greatest failures. The fall of the Jedi was his single greatest failure. But another one of those failures was the loss of Dooku. Yoda told these stories to Anakin so that he would never allow them to consume him. Yoda taught Anakin that the greatest teacher was failure, and that he should pass on everything he learned. The words said by Yoda moved Anakin to tears, but they also inspired him to not just be the best Jedi he could be, but the best man he could be. To be a good Jedi was to be a good individual. If a Jedi could not be both, then they should not be considered a Jedi. A Jedi must strive to try and achieve both of these in their lives, but also ensure they can guide others to that same level. As students, they can learn to become these individuals. As teachers, they can show individuals individuals how to become true Jedi. Yoda believed Anakin did a fine job with Ahsoka, and he was certain that Anakin would do a fine job as Grand Master. Yoda ended a message wishing the Force to be with Anakin on all of his endeavors. On Morban, the Sith collectively came together. Dooku and Sidious gathered up in the main temple, surrounded in darkness, searching for a way to take the fight to the Jedi. On the bright side, the avatars of light and dark were gone. Mother Talzin was seemingly dead, and so was Yoda, but Anakin would rise in their absence. The Force had a funny way of correcting where there was darkness. Anakin and Yours would be more powerful than even Sidious, so they had to work quickly. Sidious knew that corrupting Skywalker would likely be the hardest thing for him to do at the moment. He was so entrenched in the Jedi Order, and he was now openly Mary the Padme. So they had to do something. Dooku told Sidious that they could kidnap Padme, they could also kill her too. The Sith Lord liked that idea until he heard the sound of footsteps. Who was that? When they turned their heads, the sound of a lightsaber ignited and Palpatine was blinded. A blade cruised through his eyes and he was left without sight. Dooku ignited his weapon to defend himself. The Sith truly did collectively come together. Here, Maul and Savage trailed Dooku to the planet in hopes they could find Sidious. Without Death Watch, Maul was able to recruit a number of pirates, but his aspiration to kill Sidious remained. With Sidious completely blind, he could now focus on Dooku and then murder his former teacher. However, that wasn't exactly that simple. The Force was strong with Sidious, and he wouldn't just let anyone do that to him. His blades ignited, and they twirled around. An engagement broke off between the Sith. The dark side radiated inside the Sith Temple as the four duelists collided with each other, the scale of this battle not matching the rivalry that fell upon the Jedi Temple months before. There was a rivalry for both Maul and Savage, both of them wronged by the Sith, both with true motives for revenge against these Sith Lords. Dooku took on Savage as Maul moved against Sidious. Dooku was incredibly skilled, but Savage was hulking. He was the same beast that threw Plo Koon for a loop. He could do the same to Dooku if Dooku wasn't careful. Maul, on the other hand, may have been playing it too safe with Sidious. Decades of fear were realized here as he stood up against the man who took him from Dathomir and tortured him for his entire duration of life. Red filled the interior of the Sith Temple. Maul's double-bladed lightsaber collided with Sidious's blades. He moved like a blur and he spun around without hesitation or even missing a strike. He may have been without sight, but he was without fear. Maul was filled with it. Sidious fed off of it. Maul presented a strong force, but it wasn't as strong as he would have liked to hope it was. 
He beat at his former master, while on the other hand, Dooku tossed Savage to the side, swiftly dodging out of the way. Dooku saw an opportunity here. He shot lightning at Savage, crippling his attack before thrusting his blade through Sidious' back. Dooku leapt backwards and held his blade out in front of him. He told both Maul and Savage that they need not be adversaries. Maul slashed his blade across Sidious' dead body to ensure he was permanently dead. The two brothers turned to Dooku and looked up with disgust. Dooku knew he could take on the two of them, but he suggested they stay loyal to him, and they could take the fight to the Jedi. Without Palpatine, they could surely find victory together. The two brothers didn't like this, and they didn't like Dooku. Fair enough. Dooku had no doubt in himself. The only concern he had out of all the Sith present was the guy he just literally backstabbed. Dooku leapt down between the two brothers, moving like a younger man. His age didn't show in his fighting, and the two brothers were thrown off by it, Dooku using his skill with a lightsaber and his talents with a force. However, he had a plan. He would ensure the death of those who faced them. He separated the brothers, forcing them into different areas, before getting them right where he wanted them. He got Savage off his feet and began a duel with Maul, a speedy one at that, until Maul was right where he wanted him. Then Savage came running at him. Dooku pushed Maul back and shot electricity into the altar Sidious poured the dark side of the force into. It set off a chain reaction that blasted outwards, which exploded into a gust of blue smoke. The two brothers were thrown from their feet, their backs incinerated by the blast, as Dooku ran for the exit. As the explosion ruptured, pieces of the temple began to fall inwards. As Dooku escaped, he ran out to see a number of flying saucers. That was peculiar. Why were the pirates here? In front of the saucers, there was a man. A man Dooku hated more than just about anyone in the galaxy. As the temple crumbled behind him, Hondo showed all of his men that the big nasty horned guys were nothing but liars. Hondo was so proud of his men for acting like pirates that he figured he'd use the strategy against the big nasties. However, he never expected to find Dooku here. Didn't matter, he didn't like Dooku either. And there wasn't much of a reward for Dooku, so why not just kill him? Hondo laughed as he entered the saucer, and fire rained down on Dooku. He desperately tried to defend himself, but there was only so much he could do until he was blasted down by the pirates. They flew off. They were going to have a party back on Florum. On Coruscant, with the war over, the Jedi were completely reformed. Anakin decided it was time to restructure the Jedi Council, though he wanted to do it differently this time. There had to be a way for the Jedi to do it. He also thought about leaving Coruscant, but being on Coruscant wasn't the issue with the Jedi. It was a servitude to the Republic. The irony of these decisions for Anakin is that he would never know or be aware of the fact that he accidentally caused the destruction of the Sith through his actions. Instead, he was approached by Obi-Wan. The two of them had been friendly with each other, but they hadn't made up. So that's what they did. The two of them went on a walk throughout the temple, talking and catching up. It was very peaceful and a happy conversation. However, it ended very unexpectedly. Obi-Wan told Anakin that he was proud of him for everything he did, but it was time for him to depart the Jedi Order. Obi-Wan made it clear that he wasn't leaving because of something Anakin did, rather he was leaving because he believed another life called him. Anakin's expansion of the Jedi Code allowed for attachments, and it provoked Obi-Wan to feel things he hadn't before. Well, he had, but he hadn't accepted it. That was the big difference. He didn't accept the feeling, so this time he did, and it led him away from the Jedi. Anakin asked where he was going, and he told Anakin that he was going to propose a relationship. Or, actually, maybe he would just propose to Satine. Anyways, they had feelings for each other, so why not? Anakin wished Obi-Wan luck on his endeavor. While some Jedi were leaving the Order to foster relationships, others were growing them within the Order. One of these would be the relationship started between Quinlan Vos and Asajj Ventress. It was an unexpected duo, but in reality, it would work really well. As many Jedi were aware, Grandmaster Skywalker had a wife, so they didn't fear the idea of being ridiculed for chasing romance or just relationships. Though most of the Order stuck to being in solitude, as it fit what they'd known their entire lives. Ahsoka also at this point was now a Jedi Knight, and it gave Anakin an idea. And he decided that he would create five new Jedi Councils. Four of these Jedi Councils would revolve around Jedi Knights. These would be interchangeable councils where members changed every year. These different councils would be divided up into four different groups. Council of the Code, Council of the Blade, Council of the Force, and Council of the Jedi. Being that each of these councils had different mantras, they were meant for young Jedi to have an influence on the motives of the Jedi High Council, which would be reinstated as a Masters Only Club. The High Council wouldn't have any lifetime seats, and the Grand Master of the Jedi Order could only be put in place by the five collective council's decisions. The five councils could dictate whenever they felt a Jedi Grand Master to be against the Jedi Order, or similarly, just becoming complacent. This actually does mean, technically, that a Jedi could become Grand Master for life, but it would be entirely determined by the peers of the Jedi. A year after the end of the Clone Wars, Anakin would have his twins, Luke and Leia. Padme and Anakin had agreed over the restructuring of the relationship that if they had children, they would be allowed to become Jedi. But there was no time frame on it. 
Due to the Civil War, the Jedi were down to 7,000 members, but since the expansion to the Code, the Jedi Order size jumped up to a resounding 14,000 members. This is because people of all ages were now allowed to join the Jedi Order. Of course, these individuals had to be force sensitive within reason, but there were a hundred quadrillion sentients in the galaxy, so many of them were just genuinely special, and so many of them had the opportunity now to join the Jedi Order. The reason Anakin implemented the rule was actually because of Obi-Wan. Kenobi was allowed into the Order, but he was a late bloomer, and this was a case for a lot of people. They started showing signs of being able to use the Force once they became young adults or just adults, and by that point they weren't allowed into the Order. Now with changes to the code, they were allowed in, they could keep their relationships but also become Jedi. Though with such an increase inside the Jedi Order, the Jedi had to spread out, which led to a temple on Rhodia and also an outpost on the planet of Mygido. The intention in Anakin's mind was to go outwards and move on from the past. While remembering the past was important, to go forward was more important. Going back to Tython or Jeddah or any of the other former Jedi planets could halt their intention of going forward. Keep relics, remember the past, but don't let it engulf you. To ensure the Jedi continue their mission to remain steadfast in the moment, the new temple and outpost would be outfitted with a similar system to the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. Five new councils, each would report to the High Council on Coruscant. This would enable a total of 14 councils to report and have influence on the motives of the Jedi High Council on Coruscant. It was an intricate system, but it did foundationally change the trajectory of the Jedi Order as a whole. Skywalker, on the other hand, continued to renounce his interest in the Republic, but it didn't mean he didn't speak to the public on behalf of the citizens in the galaxy. This led to war in the Outer Rim against the crime families. But with the clones ready for action and the Jedi right there to lead the charge, the Huts, Zygerians, Pike Syndicate, and Black Sun would crumble in a matter of months. The Republic, under the guidance of Bail Organa and Padme Amidala, would stretch into the Outer Rim which would lead into the Jedi constructing an outpost on Tatooine to ensure slavery never came into the galaxy again. On Mandalore, Obi-Wan's proposal was met with open arms, two of them to be exact and a big ol' kiss. Duchess Satine was super pleased to have Kenobi back in her life, and he would join her here in Mandalore's throne. Without support from Maul or the criminal empires, pre would be uprooted and turned against. The children of the Watch would die out and their foundlings would be brought into Sundari so that this new legacy built by Satine could maintain the peace it held for 20 years prior. Anakin, Padme, and Ahsoka would all be there for the Mandalorian wedding of the millennia. With the Sith gone and erased from the galaxy, the future looked bright. Darkness would always rise, but with a new system in place, especially one curated by the Jedi, the chances for true darkness to return were thwarted indefinitely. Anakin would make amends with some of the Jedi he hadn't previously got along with, and his twins would be welcomed into the Jedi Order. Luke and Leia would receive their training from their father and Ahsoka. By the time they were young adults, the Jedi Order had expanded to an order of 24,000 members. Hard to imagine that 20 years beforehand, but it was done. This new Jedi Order was influenced by peace and justice for everyone in the galaxy, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Mr. Yeet, Gamer, Jedi Sloth, Flynn Vassis, Mad Maddy Studios, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, the man with three first names, Dark Saint 46, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button, my guys. This is a long video. Go check out the Patreon if you want to support me in other ways. Let's talk about the story we got ourselves here. Wow, this one is something special, and I wanted it to be that way. I wanted this story to be special, and I hope you guys really enjoyed this. This was a lot of fun to do, and it was really, really challenging to do. I mean, I spent so long on this story, and I made it really long because I felt like this story needed to be long. This story isn't something you can just fit into 10, 20 minutes. This video had to be like an hour long, because you just can't curate a Jedi Civil War without explaining different motives. And I really, really, really had a hard time with that. I wanted the Jedi to have genuine motives for starting the war, but I also wanted to put Anakin into a place that would have Jedi genuinely backing him. I feel like if Anakin went all Anakin about it, I don't think he would actually receive backing. Just think about how Barriss was received after she bombed the Jedi Temple. If she had a constructive means to doing so, it would actually probably be taken with great care. People would probably see your actions as something as, oh, maybe we can change the order, maybe we can do something better with it. Instead, they feared it because it was shown in terror. However, if you go about it in a peaceful way, then it won't be. You know, people are changed by love, not by hate. And so that's something you see here. People are changed by love and not hate. That's a deeper message in the story. There's tons of other deep messages layered throughout the story, and I hope you caught them. I always try and put them in the story because I want you to take something away from these stories. As for the death of the Sith, 
I didn't really feel like the Jedi had to be a part of that, and the reason that is, is because this story is about the Jedi themselves. Of course I have to get rid of the Sith somehow, and I wanted that to be set up, and that's why the whole Hondo thing was thrown in there. It was like a really random paragraph out of the blue, but that was just a setup precursor for how the ending would come along. Um, having Hondo kill the Sith is kind of funny, I'm not gonna lie. It's not the most serious death for the Sith, but I also wanted to have a showdown between Savage, Maul, Sidious, and Dooku, because that hasn't happened, you know. With his Jedi Civil War, Adi Gallia doesn't die to Savage, and so this allows Maul and Savage to capture Hondo's pirates and never interact with the Death Watch. So by doing that, they interact with these pirates that they capture from Hondo, and then Hondo's just like, oh, actually, I'm just gonna go get my pirates back because they're pirates. So I personally didn't believe the Jedi should be intertwined in the downfall of the Sith. I didn't feel like it felt right, and you know, if that makes sense, does it make sense? You know, when I'm writing these stories, I really wanted to feel right, I wanted to flow naturally, I want it to feel like it should be there, and I think if I forced the Sith to be fighting the Jedi, it would have felt forced, and I think this death for them felt a lot more natural, and it didn't feel like Anakin had to do it. Like, he didn't have to go and do it, he didn't have to be like super god, he could just like influence by the actions he created, and it was just like a butterfly effect, essentially. So anyways, hope you all enjoyed the story, if you did, smash the like button. Anyways, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.